Dog, man's best friend, pushing both man and canine to their limits. The Iditarod puts this theory to the test. The Iditarod is a dog sledding race ran every year in March. The first Iditarod ran from Anchorage to Nome was in 1973 and has been ran ever since. The Iditarod was given the nickname, the last great race for all of the above. The Iditarod is a flat, rough, and rocky trail with occasional hills. The trail is located 3,160 feet above sea level. The temperature ranges from 5 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 15 to 26 degrees Celsius. It mainly snows in Alaska due to the freezing temperatures, but when it rains, it also hails. The wildlife in this exotic environment is spectacular. There are bald eagles, black bears, brown bears, caribou, doll sheep, Canadian lynx, moose, mountain goats, muskox, orcas, polar bears, sea otters, wolverines, wolves, and over 1,100 more spectacular species. Oil is a big part of the environment of Alaska. It can greatly damage the environment by spilling or creating pollution. One of the biggest oil spills in Alaska was the Exxon Valdez tank spill. It has been considered one of the most damaging oil spills in U.S. history. It spilled over 10.8 million gallons of oil that covered over 2 million acres of land. Alaska is home to two national forests, the Tongass National Forest and the Chugach National Forest. The Tongass National Forest is the biggest forest in Alaska. The Chugach National Forest is considered a U.S. national forest which spans over 6,908,540 acres of land. In Alaska, there are two major national monuments. The Admiralty Island National Monument, which is a beautiful piece of land that spans over 955,747 acres of land and the Misty Fords National Monument that spans 2,294,343 acres of land. Alaska is a beautiful but cold environment that is a great home for many animals and a spectacular place to host. The 2016 Iditarod. On the Iditarod Trail, there are many things that could go wrong and end a disaster. There are many dangers on the Iditarod Trail that could seriously wound or kill a musher. Many of these dangers are a constant threat that could happen at any moment. Some of these events include storms, wildlife, sickness, wounds, slopes, a musher losing his sled and dogs, thin ice, uneven terrain, and other people on the trail. The dangers on the Iditarod Trail can be extremely deadly. But precautions are taken so that these situations don't end in a serious disaster. Although a musher has never died on the trail, there is always danger on the trail, and mushers must be careful and aware of these dangers. In areas such as the Dalzell Gorge, nature offers many challenges that can harm a musher. Places like the Dalzell Gorge have been worked on by their out staff to ensure the musher's safety. Make sure that everything's safe. Our trail breakers are actually leaving two days from now. They'll lead the bunch all the way to Nome this year again, and they come in and continue working on it. It's a huge project, it's a huge expense, but our concern is for the mushers and their teams, of course, then. There have also been difficulties with the Iditarod due to a lack of snow at the start. snow in Anchorage this year. We've got seven rail cars that can tip sideways that are bringing in snow from Fairbanks uh, to help supply the Iditarod and the uh, Ferrandi for what they need snow for this coming weekend. Occasionally, there have been attacks on mushers by humans, such as in 2016, where Jeff King and Ali Zirkel were attacked by a drunk driver 
on a snowmobile. Went by me at extremely high speed, within inches of my body and sled, and clipped several dogs as he went by. Um, one died almost instantly, broken leg, another impact injuries to another. I did the first aid I could and loaded him up in my trailer. Although nine were injured, multiple of Jeff King's dogs were injured and one was killed. One of the dogs got hit in the face, probably with the cowling and a lot of blood coming out of its face. And I was uh, trying to find the source of the blood and stop it. I was trying to evaluate the two that were hit um, most seriously that were um, struggling. Um, I contemplated hitting my emergency beacon, but realized that I was going to be in town before anybody could come help me and the dogs. And with the space uh, I have available to carry a dog, or dogs, I thought the best thing was to do was to try to get them in there and get to town. Where they Fortunately, Ali Zerke and her dogs were not harmed. To be honest, I wanted to believe it was accidental until I heard Allie's incident. Minutes later, she was in front of me, and she had someone turn around and, so here, make several passes at her. Jeff King's dog, Nash, was killed by the snowmobile driver, and multiple of his dogs were badly wounded. Although there are many things in the Iditarod Trail that are dangerous to mushers and their dogs, the precautions taken to avoid these events significantly help the musher and their dogs keep safe from harm. The Iditarod, one of the most harshest races on planet Earth, a musher cannot survive on his own. That is why there are checkpoints. 23 overall, these checkpoints have food, water, cabins, and hay. Without checkpoints, mushers would not be able to survive the Alaskan wilderness. A lot of work goes into the checkpoints with volunteers spending days at a time on them. Here are a few volunteers working very hard to set up a checkpoint. When a musher gets a checkpoint, he goes through a series of events. First, he has to sign in and tell the volunteer if he wants to stay or go. If he goes, then he'll be pulled to the other end of the checkpoint and go. Just like Mitch CV does in this situation. If you do choose to stay, they will take you to a nice station where you can feed your dogs and rest. Even while a musher is in a checkpoint, a lot of work still has to be done. While at a checkpoint, a musher has to do some chores, such as check the dogs for anything unusual such as diarrhea or anything in that matter. Then, the musher has to start a fire for the food and water. Then, he has to lay out the straw for the dogs to sleep on. And then comes the most important thing a musher has to do, sleep. The dogs cannot run the Iditarod on just short breaks. That is why there is a rule so they don't die of exhaustion. The rule states that a musher and his team cannot complete the race without an 8 and 24 hour break. The 24 hour break plays a big part in Iditarod with the greatest mushers using it as a strategy. The 8 and 24 hour break is a time for rest for the mushers and dogs and a time for catch up for everyone else. Checkpoints come in all shapes, sizes, and backdrops, but they all do one thing the same. Take care of the mushers. Even though they all do the same thing, some are better than others. Take Takatna and Squitna. Takatna has hot showers, fresh food, and many other wonderful things. Squitna, on the other hand, has the bare minimum. 
Not the place to take your 24 hour break for sure. Even though they each differ greatly, they are each unique in their own separate way. Here are a few checkpoints. The dogs are the heart and soul of the race. Without them and their different equipment and unique skills, there will not be the first race or the Iditarod. All of the dogs in the Iditarod are a species of husky, starting off with the Alaskan Malamute. The Alaskan Malamute is one of the oldest race dogs there are. The Alaskan Malamute is normally placed in the wheel dog position, who pulls the weight when they first take off and when they stop. Next is the Siberian Husky which are the dogs that love to run and are normally the most active. These dogs are normally placed in the team dog position. I need some wind chill. The last breed is the Alaskan Husky. The Alaskan Husky is the one who controls the direction of the team. So this breed is always placed in the lead dog position. And here are some of the teams and their different Stay dogs. We'll see you at the finish line. The dogs always need their energy to finish the race, so they feed them high protein. All the dogs on the team have high protein fat and beef for their meals. Just not feed the dogs hard dog food because it will tear up their intestines while they are digesting it and running. Now, I am going to show you a video of a time lapse of all the food that they have provided this year. That is all the food that they provided for the mushers and the dogs. As you can see, they are loaded up in bags, and that's how they transport them to each checkpoint. Now the equipment that the team uses is very specific, down to the booties on their feet. The boots on the dog's feet are used to keep them from getting frostbite, or their feet could get cold, and they will not be able to run. The harnesses are specifically put around the chest so the dogs do not choke while pulling the sled. And the guide ropes on the harnesses must be secured before they start, or they will be forced to scratch. Miss CV puts two guide ropes on each dog in case one falls off. And here's a video that gives you an up-close look of the team and the harnesses that they use. <laughs> As you can see, the guide rope running down the middle of the team and the guide ropes attached to the chest harnesses on the dogs. I, you can also see that the harnesses are not wrapped around the neck, they are on the chest of the dog. And you can also see the little shadows of the boots. Finally, when a dog is injured on the trail, the dog will be placed in the sled and is forced to be dropped at the next checkpoint due to their injuries. Also, the vets on the trail look for hypothermia. If they see any hypothermia whatsoever, the dogs will also be forced to scratch at that checkpoint. When a dog is dropped, they are sent to a vet center and then to a woman's detention center where they'll be taken care of until the end of the race. Talking about the dogs, you may be wondering what the mushers need on the trail. Some of the gear you need, according to Scott Jansen, is, well, I'll let him tell you himself.
in here are extra booties. So I'll wrap these up so they don't hurt the sides of my sled. But I stick those on the sides as kind of a support on the sides of my sleds. And then I start putting in some of my other gear. One of the things, of course, being the cooker. And the cooker is always in a spot right about there. And then the other stuff that I have here I just keep fairly open. I normally have this rolled up and taped a little bit tighter. But for these purposes, I'll just stick it right in there. And then I'll have my windsuit and my booties. And then again, this is my bag here for safety gear. I'll stick that right in there. And then my protectors for my dogs. Well, the whole sled with all... Many mushers think that other other supplies is needed, but most agree with Jansen. Other gear that is very important is food. Without food, I don't think the mushers would make it very far. At some points in the race, you need your own food, but most checkpoints feed you. At the time you don't get fed, you can pretty much eat whatever. One musher eats the last food you could think of on the trail, but this food is what every American American loves. I have a little bit of food for myself, which is a couple of pieces of uh, Pizza Olympia and, uh, and, uh, and some macaroni and cheese. Because macaroni and cheese is what I don't uh, cook it in a, in, a, in a vacuum pack. So I can cut it open and just bite off chunks of it frozen. Some of the silliest food on the trail, but what can be better than mac and cheese and pizza? Other must-have gear is clothing. If you went on the end. If you went on the Iditarod in shorts and a t-shirt, you wouldn't make it out of Anchorage. Now, depending on where you live, you have either heard of some of the clothes they use, or you may not. Mr. J says you need the following to keep from freezing. And this is what works for me. Okay, starting off with the base layers of getting dressed, I choose a smart wool wool short. Uh, use a tank here that breathes really well, wicks well. The main reason for using a, a base a, a long sleeve zip tee, also a uh, smart underneath this vest. This is a vapor barrier vest. This is zips, uh, like a jacket that has multiple pockets, chest pockets, and what have you, just to hold Great emergency piece. If you were to be totally wet, fall in a creek, you might need to strip down, and this is going to be the piece to put on. Liner sock on, just something. I have these OR Expedition gloves, and this is actual the Primo Off liner that is inside this glove. This is the only thing I have ever had to upgrade to while riding a negative 40 plus degree. Another thing to protect on your head is your eyes. I'll always have a pair of sunglasses. I prefer a polarized pair of sunglasses and something that also adjusts to the light is great. This way you only have to carry one pair of glasses that works during the day and at night. And these yellow lenses work actually great at night as well as during the day. And also when it's negative 40, uh, you, you want to protect your eyes from being frostbitten, so goggles are a great way to do that. A lot of clothes, right? At some points during the race, it gets warm enough for them to them that they don't have to wear as much layers, but that's not often. <laughs> in order to make your dogs go or stop in the race, is up to simple commands. This man uses ones that we can understand. Other mushers use commands in different languages. Whoa! And see that makes the dogs stop. And now I'll give them a command to get them ready. Ready? Hike! So hike obviously means go. Simpler than you thought, huh? Close your eyes and imagine you are a musher in it to win it. And in order to win, you need a strategy. A proven way to win is run slow and easy in the beginning, and about halfway, one run hard and take short breaks, but sometimes it backfires horribly and you end up getting a very low place. 
Now you know all you need to know about the mushers, to what they eat, and how they win. This concludes our documentary. I hope you enjoyed it.